In today's lesson, we're going to look at two different ways to define the notion of computability for functions. One of the key ideas when it comes to thinking about the power and the limits of logic is the notion of what it is for something to be computable, for when we can have a process which can give us an answer to a question or which can calculate a result. We already know that when it comes to validity and propositional logic, we can tell whether or not an argument is valid just by doing a truth table for it. The bigger the argument, the longer the truth table might take to do, but it's always going to work in a finite amount of time. We've seen that checking validity in the language of predicate logic doesn't give us this kind of recipe or routine. We can know that some things are valid by pro prov providing a proof for them. We can know that some things are invalid by giving a counterexample to them. And we know that there's always going to be an answer to the question, valid or not, but we don't know of any process that will give an, us an answer to that question in a finite amount of time. It turns out that this is not just that we're not smart enough to know of a process that can solve this for us. We can show in a precise sense that there is no process. But to do that, to show that, we need to understand the idea of computability or what can be done in a recipe in a clearer and more precise way. And that's the topic of this class and the next class. The way that people address this question is thinking about what it is for a function to be computable. And we're going to look at two different ways of answering that question. Then in the next lesson, we'll show that those two different ways come to the same answer, but they do it in very different ways. So first we need to just be a little bit more sharp and precise when it comes to how we talk about functions. We've already seen this sort of notation. The function f is a function from numbers to numbers. In this case, f of x takes the input x and returns x plus 1. So this is the function that when given 1, returns 2, when given 2, returns 3, etc. It's very tempting to just say that x plus 1 is a function from numbers to numbers, but using that notation is not very clear or precise x plus 1 isn't a function from numbers to numbers. x plus 1 is a number, but which number it is depends on what number x is. One way of thinking about this is imagine the function uh, which, given two numbers, takes one of them away from the other, the subtraction function. This is a function from pairs of numbers to numbers, but if I give you two numbers, uh, which is the one that you take away and which is the one that you take the thing away from. Here, you might think that what we do if I say x minus y is if you give me two numbers, you take the first and take the second away from it. Well, to make that idea more precise, we will say that x minus y isn't a function. It's a number uh, when x and y are numbers, at least when x is at least as big as y. Instead, we're going to use this different notation to talk about what the function is. If I've got an object in the range of my function, which what object is depends on what x is in the domain of my function, we can think of this as a function from the domain to the range. The value of a just depends on what the value of x is. So for example, the value here a is x plus 1. And that's just an object, but what object x plus 1 is depends on what object x was. And x minus y is an object, uh, and what, it, uh, what object it is depends on what x and y both are. So in general, if I've got this object and it depends on x, I'll think of the function as this thing, lambda x dot a. This is a function from the domain to the range, and what the function is, is the kind of rule or the process or the whatever it is that gets us from the domain to the range. It expects an input, and then we plug that in for where the x is in the description i. So let me give you an example. Lambda x dot x plus 1, that's a function from numbers to numbers, and this function when applied to two 
you plug it in for you plug the two in for x and you get three you apply it to five you get six and the sum function expects two inputs and so you say lambda x lambda y x plus y so this is a function which depends on x and then what comes out of that is another function which depends on y and the result of that is you add the x to the y so when you give it a number what you get is a function from numbers to numbers which when you give it another number you get the number out so let's work out an example here if i have uh, this function uh, lambda x lambda y x dot y and i apply that to the input five what do i get i get lambda y and i plug in the five for the x and i get five plus y and this is a function uh, because it gives us a number when i give a number for the input y so let's apply this to seven and then i get five plus seven which is 12. That's how this notation works. It's a way of being precise about what the function is that we're talking about. So if you like, this case of a function which has got an input and another input to give us an output, you can think of that as just expecting a pair of inputs. In this case, x and then y, because you plug in the x first and then the y. And so uh, if I've got this function subtraction, this is lambda x, lambda y, x minus y is the function which gives you a number, then you get another number, and you take the second away from the first. Whereas lambda y, lambda x, uh, x minus y is a very similar function, except it uh, gives you a number, you, you give it a number, then you give it another number, and you take the, the first away from the second. So they just treat the inputs in different ways. Now, the issue of subtraction as a function gives us a reason to think about the difference between total functions and partial functions. Addition, uh, no matter what two numbers I give you, you've got another number as the output of adding them. If we just think of natural numbers, I can add any two natural numbers together and get another natural number. So it takes pairs of numbers and gives you numbers. On the other hand, if I look at subtraction, if I give you a pair of numbers, I can take the second away from the first if the second is no bigger than the first. So for example, um, five minus three is two, but it doesn't have an output for every input. For that, we call that a partial function because three minus five, I know what that should be. That's minus two, uh, but minus two is not a natural number. It's a negative number. So we call this a partial function, and you can see here in the notation, what we have is this sort of harpoon-shaped arrow, which has only got one barb instead of two. And imagine we've broken a barb off to indicate that this is not a whole function. It's sort of part of a function. It gives you an output for some of the inputs, but maybe not all of them. So here, uh, another example of a partial function might be the divide by two function. Uh, x over two is not a natural number for every natural number input, but it is for the evens. Now for the odds, you know, five divided by two, that's two and a half, and that's not a natural number. Uh, but it is a function from the evens to the natural number. Now, functions, as we talk about them, are total functions. They have exactly one output for every input. Partial functions have at most one output for every input, and most of them aren't actually total functions. They aren't functions, but they're parts of functions, or they're almost functions, or they you know, would be functions if they were defined a little bit more. Think of the word partial in this case. It's not like a special kind of function, but like almost or fake something like that. A fake gun isn't a gun. An almost solution to a problem isn't a solution to a problem. A partial function is a part of a function. So that's all you need to know for background for notation. Now let's get on to our uh, topic, which is ways of thinking about how to compute functions. Now we've got ways of talking about functions, but now we're going to think about how we can compute functions 
One way to analyze what it is for a function to be computable is to think of computable functions as built from some basic functions that we obviously know how to compute using very simple constructors as ways of building new functions out of old functions in computable ways. So this is exactly like thinking of formulas as made out of atoms and making new formulas out of old formulas using connectives, or making proofs out of atomic proofs and extending proofs by way of the rules. We're doing exactly the same thing for functions. We've, we've got basic functions, which we just see are computable, and then we're going to make new functions out of old ones using ways of combining functions together in a computable way. And here are our three basic kinds of computable functions. We're going to call this, this class of functions the recursive functions for reasons that will hopefully become obvious soon. Don't worry if you don't see any recursion yet. These functions should obviously seem computable to you. First, the zero function, which takes an input, returns an output. How does it do it? It takes the input and ignores it and returns zero. Okay, that's easy to compute. I can compute the zero function all the time. You give me a number, I'll ignore it, and I'll say the answer is zero. Okay, the next function is the successor function, which when given an input, just adds one to it and returns the output, returns that as the output. So you give me five, I'll give you six back. You give me 73, I'll give you 74. It's a very easy thing to compute, just add one. And this final function is, or this final class of functions, because there's a lot of them, it's basically used for bookkeeping. The idea here is this is a function which expects a bunch of inputs, uh, n inputs, where n is any particular number. So there's a version of this function which has got three inputs. And what it does is it returns one, of, one particular one of those inputs as an output. And for each number of inputs and each particular output you could choose, we've got a version of this id function which does that. So, let me give you an example. One ID function is ID32. So this expects three inputs, X1, X2, and X3. And what does it do? It returns the second one as an output. Ignores the other two things and just throws them away and returns the second. So for example, ID of three and two, when applied to five, seven, and eight uh, returns seven, whereas id and three one of five, seven, and eight will return five, and id of four um, one, uh, one, two, three, four will return one. It's just a bookkeeping device. Uh, what's the reason for it? We'll see. We'll see very soon. Now I want you to think about the question, if I've got some functions, how can I combine them to make new functions? An obvious thing to think is that we can sort of chain them together. So for example, we've got the successor function, which in comes x and out comes x plus 1. What I could do is do another successor function and out comes x plus 2. You know, if I can compute the successor function, then I can compute the add to function just by doing successor and then successor again. This is what's called composing two functions. This is the composition of the function s and the function s. We'll have a notation for this, which is called composing s with s. And this is something that you can do in general. If I've got a function, I can just stick it together with another function and get uh, a new function, which is just do the first, then the second. Take the input and then take the output of that function and then apply it as an input to the next one. And this is the key idea behind composition, but 
it gets more complicated when it comes to having functions which have more than one input, like addition. Now, you'll notice that addition wasn't one of our basic functions, but we'll be able to define it really soon. But imagine we've got some function, which I'll just call sum, which takes two inputs, x and y, and returns out the other end, x plus y. And we want to compose this with another function, uh, like do sum again, uh, and have another input, z, and get x plus y plus z. Now we've got a more complicated uh, question when it comes to how to compose functions when functions have got more than one input. How are we going to specify how it is that we're composing sum with sum in a new function to get uh, a new function out of the old one? Well, here's what we're going to do. If I want to compose a function f with some other things where that function expects m inputs, what I'm going to compose it with is a bunch of m other functions, g1 up to gm, and I'm just going to assume that all of those functions expect the same number of inputs, but that number might be a different number than m, but I'll call that number n. And the function, the input of our composed function is the inputs that we give to each of these functions uh, g. So f is the thing that I'm doing at the end, and x1 up to xn are the inputs that I'm giving, and I'm giving those same inputs to each of these m g functions, and then taking the results of those and feeding them to the function f. So here's what it looks like. f is producing my result, it is expecting um, m inputs, and we're getting them from these g functions, g1 up to gm, and we are putting the same inputs, x1 up to xn, in all of them. And what's the function that we get? It expects these n inputs, lambda 1, lambda x1, lambda x2, up to lambda xn. We put those inputs into each of the g functions. That's what this notation says. So we put those functions into those inputs into g1, g2, up to gm. We get the results of those inputs, and then we feed them into f. And that's the answer. And now we can see what these id functions are for. They're basically used to ensure that the correct inputs are passed to each component. We can use them to sort of modify the number of inputs that we've got. So I'll give you an example of this. Let's imagine we can already compute sum and product, and I want to figure out how to combine these things to get x plus y times x plus z. That's just sort of chaining together uh, product and sum. So this is a function which we'll think of as expecting three inputs, x, y, and z. And it returns the first plus the product of the second and the sum of the first and the third. That's what this is all saying. Now, to show you how we, you can do this from functions which compute plus and compute uh, times, we will work from the inside out. Look at this x plus z. We can assume we've got a function which, when take, given two objects, returns their sum. We'll call that the sum function. If you look at the x plus z that we have here, the x and the z are the first and the third inputs of our function, and we want to add them together. The sum function just takes two inputs and returns their output. It's not going to expect three. So this is where the id functions come in. id31 expects three inputs and returns the first of them. And id33 also expects three inputs and returns the third. So if we have x, y, and z going into both of these functions, out comes x from id31, and out comes z 
from ID33, and then out comes X plus Z from their sum. And this is the composition that we need. We've got this function, which I'll call the composition of uh, sum, together with ID31 and ID33. It's now a function which expects the inputs X, Y, and Z and out comes x plus z, which is what we want. Now for the next stage, we want to take y and multiply that with the result x plus z. For that, we'll assume we've got this product function, which we want to feed it y as one input and the x plus z as the other, and out we want to get y times x plus z. Now this whole thing wants to expect as inputs x, y, and z, so I'll write them here as well, uh, but out of this we want to get the y as the first input of the product, so we'll use an id, now it's 3, 2 to get the y out of the x, y, and z, and now prod, uh, the product function is um, taking two, is being composed with two functions, one ID32 here, and the other, this whole composition here, and we combine those two as feeding in inputs to prod to give us this output. So the result here is another composition, which I've now represented in this green box, of prod, which is the final thing, together with ID32, which supplies its first input, in this case Y, and then this composition that we already had here, which takes the first and the third inputs and returns their sum. Now we're nearly done. All we've got left is to uh, add x to this. So what we want to do now at the end is do a sum, which sums together uh, x and the result of the rest of the calculation. And to feed the x in, we'll just need another ID function, in this case, ID31, to select X out of X, Y, and Z. And then to stick these together, we just need one more composition. So the whole result is the composition of this sum function with this ID function with this whole thing here. And the thing you get is a function which expects three inputs and returns the sum of the first input with the product of the second input with the sum of the first and the third. So the inputs of the function we're thinking of as three numbers, x, y, and z, and the output is a number. But these constructors, composition, are ways of combining functions together. These things are not inputs to a function. These are functions that we are chaining together by means of composing one with the other with the other in something which looks like sort of a series of nesting dolls like this, where we are taking the result of one computation or one calculation and feeding it into another and feeding it up the chain until we get our result. Now, if you've ever followed recipes, this is the kind of thing that you've seen before. Uh, this is the kind of process of doing something, then taking the result of that and doing something. Oh, and by the way, you could do this too. It doesn't matter whether you do this before this or that, or even doing those things at the same time. But you need to do these things in order to do that, and then you do this in order to do that, and then you've got the result. The thing about this way of sticking things together is you only ever do any of these steps once. You do this, then do that. You do this and that and that, and so on. If you look at this, there's nothing where you've got to do this again and again and again and again and again. There's nothing which says, take some number of uh, bananas and for each banana peel it where if you have 10 bananas, that's going to take 10 steps. If you have 100 bananas, that's going to take a lot more steps. There's nothing like that. Each thing here, each step of the diagram is just one calculation or one computation or one step of the process. There's nothing here which the number of times that you do it depends on the input that you're given. But that's a kind of calculation which we know how to do.
but that's a different kind of calculation than just composing things or adding one or selecting zero or doing one of these ID functions. Each of those are just one-shot things. There's another kind of calculation where the number of times you do it depends on the input that you have. And this is where recursion comes in. And so this is where I'm going to make good on the promise that we can actually define sum and prod, sum and product, using successor and zero and the ID functions and composition. But we need to do something else. Because, for example, adding five kind of takes five steps. You add one five times. And multiplying by three takes three steps if you're adding the two together uh, if you're adding two to itself three times, you know, two plus two plus two to make three times two, that's three steps of addition. So let's let's think about how this works. Here's how you could define addition, the, the sum function, just using success. I can say that I know how to sum x and zero. You just ignore the zero and return x. Adding zero is just like doing nothing. That's sort of the base case. And then if I already know how to add y, here's how you can add y plus 1. To add y plus 1, you just add y first, and then you take the successor of the result. So this is just the composition of successor and the previous version of sum, if you like. So here's how you can sum x and y plus 1. You sum x and y first, and you then take the successor of that. So here's how this works out in practice. If I want to sum x and 5, well, I just look at the cases that I have. It's not the base case, because 5 isn't 0. Uh, 5 is 4 plus 1. So that's the successor of the sum of x and 4, which is the successor of the successor of the sum of x and 3, which is the successor of the successor of the successor of the sum of x and 2. See how this goes. Successor, 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 successor of the sum of x and 1. And finally, it's the successor and the successor and successor and successor and successor of the sum of x and 0. But the sum of x and 0 is just x. So if I want to sum x and 5, whatever x is, I just take x and successor it five times, which is exactly what you'd expect. And using the same technique, we can define multiplication, the product function, from the addition function. If I already know how to sum, and this is how I sum, I can now product. The product of x and 0 is just 0, the number 0. So you can take x and 0 it out. That's the base case. And then if I want to take the product of x and y plus 1, I can just take the product of x and y, whatever that is, and add x to it. Take the sum of the product of x and y and x. So here's how this works. The product of x and 3 is just the sum of the product of x and 2 and x. But the product of x and 2, I'll do again. That's the sum of the product of x and 1 and x. And the product of x and 1 is just the product of x and 0 and x summed. And what's the product of x and 0? Well, it's just 0. So I just sum together 0 and x, and then sum x to that, and sum x to that. So this is 0 plus x plus x plus x, x plus x plus x three times. And this is a really basic form of computation that we call recursion. It's a bit more complex than composition, because composition is just do this, do that, do that. Whereas uh, recursion, uh, now, the number of times that I do something depends on one of my inputs here. Here, if I'm summing x and 5, I did successor five times. If I was taking the product of x and 3, I do sum three times. And so this is like do something for each number of an input that I have. And I count that number down uh, using the iterator until I get to the base case. I sum all the way down until I get to this base case, uh, which is given by another definition, which is something else that we can compute. In this case, it's an identity. Uh, just return x, uh, the input x, return x. And in this case, it's the zero function. Take the input x and zero it out and use zero. Here's the general form of this. It's the primitive recursion of a base case and an iterator. Now, in general, the base case is just going to be some function, which 
uh, it takes n inputs. And so what we're doing is we're defining a function by primitive recursion that takes n plus 1 inputs. And we're thinking of the last input of this function as the thing that we are counting down. And so f is the, the base case, g is the iterator. Then the primitive recursion of f and g uh, takes the inputs and we're just thinking of the first n inputs of our function as uh, using this vector notation, x with an arrow over it. So I'll just explain that. x with an arrow over it is shorthand for x1, x2, x3, up to xn. So it might be three things. In the case of sum, it's just one thing, because we define the sum of x and 0. But in general, we might want to uh, define a more complex function with more inputs uh, by primitive recursion. Primitive recursion of f and g uh, is f for the base case. So we take the last input of our function to be 0, and we just look up our base case function, whatever that is. Call that f. And then if I want to do a primitive recursion step, that applies when my input is not 0. And here, I take my input to be you know, the x's together with y plus 1. So the last input's the thing that we're counting down, and now it's y plus 1, and this is the iterator. So I use my iterator function g, and what's my function g allowed to uh, look at to do the calculation? Well, it looks at the other inputs, x. So I have to look at y as well, and then it looks at the result of doing the primitive recursion on the previous case. So this is a case where, to calculate this function, the primitive recursion of f and g, on y plus 1, I use the calculation on y as its last input. And this, if y is not 0, is going to use this again. And then we're going to use it again and again and again. How many times will we use it? We will use it y more times. So here's how the setup works in the case of prod and sum. Here's the sum function the function which takes two inputs and returns their sum, it's the primitive recursion of the id11 function. That's a one input function for the base case. And the composition of successor and id33, that is a three input function for the iterator. Let's see how that works by applying the definition. The sum function applied to x and zero is the base case, id11, applied to x, and that is just x. And for the iterator, the sum of x and y plus 1 is this composition function applied to x, y, and the sum of x and y, because that's what the general definition of uh, primitive recursion says. The function that we're defining applied to x and y plus 1 is the step function g, in this case, that composition function applied to x, y, and the result of the function that we're defining applied to x and y. But what is that? What's that function? The composition of successor and id33 applied to these guys? It's just the sum of x and y with the successor applied to it. And that's exactly what we want for the base case. To calculate x plus y plus 1, calculate x plus y, and then add 1. You can do exactly the same thing for product goes like this. What's the product of x and 0? It's the 0 function applied to x, namely 0. And the product of x and y plus 1 is just this composition function applied to x, y, and the product of x and y. And that's the product of x and y added to x. So that should give you an idea of how primitive recursion works. To keep on with the cooking metaphor, there's one other kind of thing that you can do when you're cooking. Sometimes your instructions say, do this for each of your bananas, or crack each of your eggs, and that sort of thing, where when you see the eggs, you can see how long that's going to take. You just have one for each egg that you have. Uh, the other thing that can happen is an instruction which says, you know, whip this until peaks form. And there, you have no idea how many steps something is going to take. You just do things, check the result each step, and depending on what the result is, you either stop or you keep going. This is the one instruction which can result in something not terminating. This is why this kind of instruction gives us what's called a partial function, 
instead of a function in some cases. So here's the general scheme. I can minimize a function which has n plus 1 inputs. The result is going to be a function which has n inputs. And here's what I do. The minimization of f is the smallest number y where f and the other inputs plus y as the last input is equal to 0. And it's undefined if there's no value of y that makes f of x and y equal to 0. This can be calculated using this process of try something, check, try something, check, try something, check, until a value turns out to uh, work. Here's the process. We start off by letting y be 0, and we calculate f applied to the x's together with y. And if it is 0, we return y, but if it isn't, we add 1 to y, and we try it again. And then, so when we start, we calculate fx and 0. If the result isn't 0, we keep going, and if it is, we return 0. And if it isn't, we add 1 to y, and we try it again. If f applied to x and 1 isn't 0, we keep going, but if it is, we return 1. So then, if it isn't, we add 1 to y, so we calculate f, x, and 2. If it is 0, we stop and return 2, and if it isn't, we add 1 to y and keep going. And we keep going and going and going and going and going until we can find a 0. So to see how that works, let's see an example of how it's going to be used to define a function. The function that we'll define will have a few components which we'll first define. The first is this pred function. This is defined by primitive recursion. The base case is the constant 0. And the iterator says that pred of y plus 1 just chooses y, the first out of y and pred of y. So we can see that pred of 0 is 0, pred of 1 is 0, pred of 2 is 1, and so on. It's called pred because it's the predecessor function. For every number, it chooses the number before, except there's nothing before 0, so pred of 0 is still 0. We can use pred to define by primitive re recursion this function, which we'll call r sub. This is a two-place function where r sub of x and 0 is just id 1, 1 of x, which is x. And r sub of x and y plus 1 is this composition function applied to x, y, and r sub of x and y. What's that? That is just the predecessor, pred, of r sub of x and y. And if you work out all of the details, r sub of 5 and 2 turns out to be 3, because what we do is we just repeatedly uh, take a predecessor of 5 as many times as 2, and that takes us down to 3, whereas r sub of 2 and 5 takes 5 lots of predecessor of 2, which takes us all the way down to 0, and then just stays there because predecessor of 0 is 0. It's called r sub because this is restricted subtraction. We subtract as much as we can, and then we stop and give it the answer 0, even if we try taking more away than there is to take away. So now we've got the function that we want to minimize. The composition of r sub with id3, 1, and the composition of prod and id3, 2, and id3, 3, 3. Let's first figure out what this function is. At the end, it's going to take r sub and apply that to two inputs. The first of those is going to be the first of the three inputs that the function takes, and the second is going to be the product of the second and the third. So if we call those inputs x, y, and z, we take r sub of x and the product of y and z. So this is the function that we're minimizing. And how minimization works, we take the last input, in this case z, and we iterate it, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc., until we get a value of 0, given the other inputs x and y. Let's see how this works. Let's apply the function to the inputs 3 and 2. If we call the function that we are defining d, then d of 3 and 2 is calculated like this. We apply our function to 3, 2, and 0 and see what we get. The result is 3, and that isn't 0. 
so we try it again with 3, 2, and 1. Now the result is 1, which is closer to 0, but still isn't 0, so we try it again. R sub of 3, 2, and 2. The result now is 0, so the last input that we chose, namely 2, is the answer for this function. D of 3 and 2 is 2. If you try it for yourself, you'll see that the result of our function applied to 4 and 2 will be 2 as well. And the result of our function when applied to 5 and 2 will be 3. It's worth thinking about what happens when we apply the function to, say, 5 and 0. We calculate R sub of 5 and 0 times 0, which is 5. So we try R sub of 5 and 0 times 1, which is also 5 and then r sub of 5 and 0 times 2, etc., etc. No matter how much we crank up this last input, the fact that we are multiplying it by 0 means we'll get nowhere. We'll never have a large enough value to subtract from 5, because the value that we're subtracting from 5 is always 0, and so d of 5 and 0 is undefined. Now, what is this kind of function that we've got? It's a kind of division function. d of x and y is x divided by y rounded up to the nearest whole number. And of course, x divided by 0 is undefined. So now we have a definition of all of the class of recursive functions. The recursive functions are the functions that we can define they're partial functions, total functions, that include the basic recursive functions, the zero, successor, and identity functions, and which you can build up using composition, primitive recursion, and minimization. In other words, every recursive function is either a basic recursive function, or it's composed out of other recursive functions by means of the constructors, and nothing else is a recursive function. I'm going to stop this video here and have a new video to introduce the other way of defining recursive functions. That's by way of register machines.